All right, sorry for the delay. I was just sharing the notes stuff in Slack. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Emily Lesak, and I am the event fund manager at Code for Science and Society. And today I will be co-facilitating this session um, with, uh, with uh, thanks, Robin Champeau, Ted Ladaris, uh, Samuel Guay, and Meg Doherty. Um, and our session is on supporting open research communities during COVID. And I'll give each of my co-facilitators a chance to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, Robin, would you like to go first? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Robin Champeau, and I um, am the Director of Education Research and Clinical Outreach uh, at the Oregon Health and Science University Library in Portland, Oregon. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and um, at OHSU, among other things, uh, I collaborate with Ted um, on a open science and a data science co-learning community uh, called BioData Club. Thanks, Robin. Uh, Ted, would you like to introduce yourself next? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ted Ladaris. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in bioinformatics at Oregon Health and Science University. And I have um, had quite a long uh, a journey of, through open science, and I have learned so much from everyone. So we, uh, Robin and I co-host BioData Club, but I also help organize um, the PDXR user group. And um, I'm also a co-organizer for Cascadia R, which is the regional R conference um, that's going to be happening next year. Great, thank you. Uh, Samuel? Hi everyone, I'm Samuel Gay. I'm a PhD student at the University of Montreal. I co-founded Open Science U Montreal uh, as a student-led initiative to spread open in initiatives, uh, which we aim to maybe form a Canadian network. And I'm also involved in the BrainHack community and we're currently at the end of our um, global BrainHack, which uh, reunited 15 sites um, all together this year. Great, thanks. And Meg? Yeah, hey everyone, uh, Meg Darty. I'm here today with my Open Life Science hat on, um, a group that um, Samuel and I are part of, where I am a mentor for an open hardware project, uh, this, this cohort. And I also have a group called Tech Rebalanced for underrepresented technologists in the Washington DC area, which is normally an in-person event but has moved online in 2020. Thank you. Uh, so before we launch into our session today, we have a few expectations. Um, so we plan to spend a lot of time today sharing experiences. Um, so we do expect you to speak in the first person based on your own experiences. Um, and also be mindful of who is speaking, make space for traditionally marginalized voices. We'd like to make sure that everyone gets a chance to participate. Um, do practice active listening. Um, and these are in addition to adhering to the J. Ross Code of Conduct. Um, and we can ref uh, you can refer to the Code of Conduct uh, Slack channel um, if you uh, would like to review it. Um, and you're welcome to share questions or comments in the collaborative doc, um, which is linked here on this slide. It's also available in the Slack channel for conference chatter, um, or you're welcome to unmute yourself um, and speak up. We'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so any way that you want to participate, um, whether it's through the doc or through speaking up, um, we would be happy to hear your experiences. Um, so our big goal for today is for us to have a candid discussion about how we as community leaders can welcome diverse participants, cultivate inclusive and accessible events, and create open products. And to do that, um, we'll talk a little bit about the format. So we're going to do this through exploring several scenarios that you may have experienced as a community manager or community leader. Um, and we encourage you again um, to take notes in our collaborative doc. Um, we've also started a resources list that we hope will grow throughout the course of this session. Um, and again, uh, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so whatever your comfort level is in sharing, um, we'd love to hear from you all. And there's the link to the collaborative doc once again. Um, so Robin, would you like to introduce the first scenario? 
Yeah, sure. As soon as I unmute myself, every time. Okay, so um, scenario one, um, really thinking about this um, um, when we brainstorm is so like thinking about sort of the journey of, um, of um, developing um, um, a community. We're starting with this scenario, which is I launched my open source community earlier this year and I'm struggling to build momentum. Um, I have a vision for my project, but I'm missing the processes to onboard new members and keep them involved. After all, I'm only one person right now. And what we're hoping we can start with this scenario and then thread it through the others is really discussing um, um, among all of us as have you been in this situation? Um, what challenges did you face? And what resources did you find helpful um, in this part of your journey uh, as a community organizer? Or you might be doing in this part of your journey right now. Does someone want to uh, to start uh, with some of their own experiences? Samuel, can I put you on the spot since you had talked about how this yeah. this scenario resonated with you? Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry, because I know we're having some internet problems. So I wasn't sure if I was frozen or not. Um, so yes, I, I can talk about how we got started during COVID, which is uh, not the ideal situation, I'd say, to start a community. Um, so yes, I've been in this situation. In fact, I'm still in this situation. Uh, when you're trying to find people to collaborate and start something, when you cannot meet them face to face, it's another challenge. Um, so this is one challenge we've, we've faced. And then once we made the move to go fully online, we also add some challenges towards um, which platform we were going to use, um, how we were going to find the people because people are engaged in many things. Um, so we don't we didn't want to um, overload them as well. Um, so we're mostly there. We've set up some secured um, communication platform, um, but that's the recruiting. It's kind of slow, I'd say. And um, and Samuel, what? If you could share with us if there are like things that have been particularly helpful, resources or tools as you've uh, as you've sort of met those challenges. Oh no! Now no, it looks like he's through. gone. Yeah, I, I was gonna ask. I, I know just from some of the names that we have some people here who have been in that spot. I know personally, I was involved in certain like some projects that like didn't work or didn't work that well, but I learned a lot. Um, but I can't really imagine how the the complexity and communication challenges of COVID would have really added to that. So I wonder if um, someone who has gotten something off the ground could talk a little bit about how they dealt with it. I think we might have lost him entirely. Um, I'm happy to share your screen or sh share your screen, share the presentation. If, if that's I think cool. we're okay. Um, we okay. also have the scenarios on the shared doc. Oh, okay. Um, so thank you. Yeah, that's a great point, Danielle. I think um, sort of sharing both successes and like <laughs> tools and stories of like moving through challenges, but also just like normalizing failure and like learning from that. Um, those stories are really welcome and I think incredibly I, valuable to share. I'm thinking of a project Daniela and I did in 2016 when the Trump travel ban um, kicked off. We were trying to um, collect statements from um, scientific societies about 
how they were responding to that and which scientific societies were going on the record um, in opposition to the traveling ban because these are mostly like global societies that should want travel to be more free. Um, and we found like, you know, but so we had this group of people and we were doing these calls, but it was, you know, a lot of, there are so many societies and uh, like a lot of projects, you know, it was a great group of people, but we didn't really know where we were going. We just felt like we had to do something. And um, I feel like I learned a lot about, you know, articulating the goals for where I, I you know, I'm doing a lot of work right now. Where is it going to get me? or not, you know, me, but like the movement. And, um, you know, we, we, that project produced a spreadsheet, which is useful, right? But um, it, it, in other ways, it like didn't work the way we wanted it to work, right? Um, and so I, I learned some stuff. <laughs> I, I think, yeah. yeah. Um, I think one thing to think about is like calibrating your expectations in times of COVID, because I think we all have very high expectations of ourselves and it's okay if you, you can't meet all of those expectations. <laughs> yeah, and one thing to add, I think momentum building is a really common problem with new communities. And I think it's important to know your community members and know what they want to get out of belonging in your community. Um, because I think particularly now we're all pretty strapped for free time. Um, so we're really careful about how we wanna spend our time and making sure that we're um, you know, maximizing our time and, and using it wisely. Um, so I, I think you know, maybe surveying members or having informal conversations with them to figure out what their goals are and, and what they hope to get out of it. And then seeing what you can do to help them meet those goals, uh, I think could be important. Yeah. Hey, is it, I, I missed the part where it, is it good if non-Pano people jump in? Yeah, cool. Yeah. So there was a um, open, I was involved in open science when FriendFeed was still a thing. <laughs> there were a bunch of people on FriendFeed and I'm pretty sure it was there that I first heard this quote, which I really like, which is data finds data, then people find people. It was something like that. And I don't even remember who says it. <laughs> Is that it, Cameron or something? Um, and um, I think that um, maybe starting with community is a hard place to start. At least I found that to be true. And a bit like what Danielle was saying about starting with a spreadsheet, in her case, maybe it didn't work. But I think there's something there actually. Like if you're producing a thing that other people are going to find useful or that they're going to want to contribute to or something like that, then then the people find each other and they've got a common cause. So um, I think there's something to be said for that approach. And I, I can speak to the group that I have with Open Life Sciences right now, um, the mentee, he's working on open hardware project that um, he's been doing on his own as part of his PhD program. And one of, one of the big challenges in his process has been the first few contributors that are coming to his project have really strong opinions. And, and if you're new to setting this up, there's this, you know, temptation to kind of cater to some of these first visitors. Um, I don't know if there, there's something to be said, right, about just knowing somebody in person and, and meeting them and getting to know them and we have a working relationship. But I think that's another um, a challenge that comes up in this, in this um, starting phase. Robin, do you have anything else that you wanted to touch on with this scenario? No, I mean, I just a, a, a couple um, uh, maybe thoughts and sort of synthesizing just uh, what I've been hearing. And thank you, everyone, for um, sharing your experiences and ideas. Um, I'm sort of thinking like one thing we we could have put a scenario in about, you know, both starting a community and launching a community during kinds of COVID, but also like closing a community or saying like this project is done during COVID. And I think that's sort of a, another sort of difficult and interesting lens to think about in terms of the life cycle of the project. And maybe at the end, if we have time for that. Um, 
I can say like personally, these ideas of like something tangible and also like ideas for keeping momentum and how hard it is has been really valuable. And it's just valuable to hear that other people struggle with it. <laughs> um, something that um, Ted and I have tried to do, I think all along, but also within the context of these times is, um, um, is just like kind of like using our online space to model staying engaged in some ways in these like really light and low risk ways to <laughs> so like just asking a question that you're struggling with. And like, I could go and look in like Stack Overflow for that, but I could just ask my, my friends in uh, Bio Data Club. And when we start doing that, we see more people do it. And it sort of, um, I think adds an energy in a time that is otherwise hard to sort of contribute um, yeah. in that space. I, 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 that really, that's a great point, Robin, because I think there's an activation energy for people to participate. And the more you can do to lower that and kind of encourage people. And I think Lou Woodley always says, you know, find ways for people to easily contribute um, and thinking about kind of those kinds of things. Um, I think that's really important. Should we move on to the next scenario? I'm happy to move on. So hi, everyone. So we're on, now on scenario two. And I think this is um, where a lot of us may be. Um, so you are you have an already established organization and you know COVID happened and you start decided to start hosting your first online event. Um, so there's a and there's a lot of information out there. There's lots of checklists and blog posts about um, people's advice how to do this successfully. Um, but like the like many of us, time and resources are very limited. So how do we kind of how do we kind of um, hit like you know and get inclusion and accessibility right with these kind with our own limited time resources? So um, has anyone been in this situation and would like to talk about it? Yeah, Erin. Um, so yeah, this one um, I have. I've been in acutely. Um, so I was the executive director of ESIP, the Earth Science Information Partners, and we have two in-person meetings a year. And then a lot of our work is done remotely and virtually. Um, but we decided in April that July, the July meeting obviously couldn't happen. Um, and so we moved into the online space. So, yep, I have, I have real world experience on this one. Yeah. It's it's been it's been a challenge. Um, like we've I've been kind of participating in two orgs that have been moving online, and it has been trying to get people. I know people want to contribute, but again, it's like trying to figure out ways for them to contribute that doesn't kind of suck up their time, and being kind of mindful of everyone and their goals. I think is really important. Um, so, I, yeah, um, one thing that um, we have been doing with PDXR, and hope maybe this will resonate with other people, is we have been thinking about roles for, pe for people to kind of inhabit. So for like events, for example, like, you know, we have basically an event host and there are certain duties that they are responsible for just kind of making sure that the event is running online and just kind of keeping conversation going. Whereas, you know, we've got um, some participants in our org committee that they really don't have that much time, but they can help with promotion, for example. And we've got like templates and things for them to kind of help engage other people. Has anybody kind of thought about these kinds of roles? Yeah, I just want to say I agree um, that I, I think organizing a conference by yourself is not a great idea. <laughs> one person can only wear so many hats. Um, so I, I think one of the key aspects of organizing a virtual event is finding a diverse committee where people have different backgrounds and experiences that lend themselves to different roles, such as you know advertising, code of conduct, scheduling, um, so that one it doesn't fall on one person's shoulders. 
Um, so yeah, I think that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. And Ted, we didn't really articulate, we didn't, um, I guess, codify it, but we had a staff person that was always in the room, kind of in the safety, moderating the chat, um, making sure that the tech worked. And then we had session conveners who were really responsible for kind of the content and um, and leading the session. And then we would normally have a community fellow too, who was also in the room and in that kind of supportive um you know, monitoring the chat, trying to um, mm -hmm. help the group come to takeaways and bring things back to the larger group. Um, so we did, we definitely found, you know, more people were needed. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, and that monitoring the chat, I mean, it, it's actually, I think it's a really great way to like make people who don't necessarily like, they, they're not comfortable speaking out, out loud, but it gives them a voice because you're basically kind of speaking for them and they feel like, you know, they're part of the community. And I think that's, is, that's a really important, a really important role to inhabit. Um, uh, so any, I, I guess, um, in terms of diversity and inclusion, do people have any thoughts about like, or accessibility? People have any thoughts or ch challenges they've been facing with kind of making your events online in terms of these two? I have a comment to add there. Um, I've been involved in two communities that have annual events. This is one of them. And in both cases, um, the events were much larger when they were online. And so that has, you know, obviously, um, you all heard my spiel about our Zoom bombing harassment incident today, but, um, and that didn't happen in the other community, but it was, um, it, it's, it, it is a lot, it, it's a lot of work to produce um, an online space that is accessible to people. And I think the benefits are that people who have caring responsibilities, people who can't travel, people who couldn't afford to come or afford to take the time off are all able to attend or they're able to dip in, go to a talk that they really care about and then leave and not spend you know, four days at an event. I think that's great. Um, so it really broadens your audience, but the challenge for organizers is I think the idea that you're, you know, you're no longer like worried about the caterer showing up on time. So you have this like different set of things that can stress you out, but it's still stressful. <laughs> it's not easier. <laughs> I, I, I hear you, Danielle. It's, there's, there's, it, it comes with its own set of challenges. Um, okay, so I'm just looking at the doc, um, just seeing if there's any. Uh, so someone is pointing out adapting the code of conduct for online platforms. Uh, did whoever, um, uh, put that in the doc, but you like to talk about it? Hi, it's me. I'm back. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have any camera anymore. But uh, so, yes, we've been trying to adapt our code of conduct to make sure we cover most of the stuff that can happen online, but not uh, in person. Um, just basically because of anonymity that can happen online cannot really happen in person. Um, and we still haven't found, because we're tied to the university, we're kind of embedded in the code of conduct of the university, but I think the university doesn't do enough, uh, just because we've been in situation and it's, it takes forever to, um, act on when stuff happen. So we're kind of in limbo for this, to be honest. Uh, but we've managed to like make something open and uh, where people can comment if they have like idea and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's another challenge. For sure. Um, so I'm just looking in terms of someone put in the chat. So we engaged a third party service for reporting code of conduct violation reporting. Um, whoever uh, can, can whoever put that in, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, so Ted, that was me. Um, so again, back to ESIP. Um, one of the things that our community had been concerned about was this anon anonymity of um, reporting and of people feeling like um, they could report safely. And um, and so 
and we hadn't been getting a lot of reports. And um, so we did engage this third party service whistleblower and they have a phone number and a form that you can fill out. And then sort of depending on who's involved, that depends on who gets notified. So normally as the executive director, I would get notified, but if I had been um, involved, then our president would be notified. And, you know, it was, it was I think a really nice um, service that we've, we've liked so far. And then the other thing is that it allowed the person to be as anonymous as they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So they could provide their contact information to whistleblower or not, but they would still, um, as long as they remembered the login, they could still come back and check on, you know, what action we had taken. That's, that's really great. I had never even kind of thought about that, that that kind of service exists. So this is why it's so awesome for us to kind of all talk yeah. and kind of share these kinds of resources. Color me interested. <laughs> so actually, we stole this from Mozilla. Um, Mozilla oh, okay. has a pretty great um, code of conduct reporting system. And I think we're using their same, the same provider that they use was the one that we ended up going with. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I think the place where we still have a challenge is one, having a culture of feeling like reporting is okay, even in this third party space. Um, and I was really happy to see a couple of times in this meeting, you know, and today, Danielle, when you brought up, you know, having, having that incident, this was the action that we took um, and letting the community know that you're responding. Um, but the other is we also, there, since I've left, they're still really struggling with, so what happens if you have an active community member who violates the code of conduct and what are the kind of the procedures for handling that and, um, and investigating it? So I think that's still, the third party helps with reporting, but it doesn't help with yeah. the It's next still steps. on the community to yep. take actions and yeah. we yeah. can we could have a long conversation about that, I'm <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. that's in some ways the hardest part of um, being responsible for a code of conduct mm -hmm. is not creating that code of conduct. And there's so many great models to choose from. Yeah. Um, it's when you have to enforce it. Um, 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 and especially in serious um, situations. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, I think that's uh, where it becomes really important to, uh, you know, I think of this like all the time in my like everyday academic life is that we put people in like mentorship positions that haven't ever mentored anyone or, you know, and that, um, and we often can accidentally put people in the position of managing a code of conduct without training and resources um, to um, to be able to enforce that. Yeah, for sure. It is, it is a real concern. Um, um, oh, oh, go ahead, Sam. Here you go. Uh, well, have, has anyone de dealt with uh, like having a code of conduct, like a global code of conduct? Because for brain hack or like it's in basically it could happen in every country so we were really concerned about uh can we like about the laws over there we don't know all the laws in every country so we had really to be um cautious about that so does anyone have thought about our resources on like how to structure uh, this kind of code of conduct um, I, I i mean i think i'd advise you to look at other organizations that operate globally. I don't, I think, I think you're smart to be thinking about those risks and how, how to mitigate them. There's also a lot that um, a lot of the language that we use in the States may not resonate or may mean really different things in other contexts. That's also something we've come up across. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear Robin and Aaron's take on that. Like, so I would advise you to look at Mozilla, look at OpenCon, um, look at the gathering of open source hardware. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to think of some other organizations. Our, our Ladies Global yeah. is really good too. But it, it's challenging. Yeah, I guess I, I would 
like the frankest answer I probably have is like, I don't think a single organization is completely solved to this. Um, um, and I think one complexity is that a code of conduct is not necessarily a legal document, nor is it necessarily enforced through legal bodies um, and, a, and a, any one institution or uh, uh, um, places legal system. Um, and I think um, that it, it's really complicated. <laughs> and I think, and I, I, I think, you know, it's sad that some, that there's so much learning happening in right now, I think, because we're learning because violations are happening. Um, but um, uh, uh, I do think that there's probably um, some synthesis of experiences that uh, would be really valuable to have happen um, in a more deliberate way. Yeah. Great, this is like a really important discussion. Does anyone else have anything to contribute about um, code of conduct? Um, not to that one, but I was wondering, so hello, by the way, sorry for mm -hmm. my face is like, so I'm still speaking, so I'm kind of here as a guest of STEM, uh, so uh, we are working together in Brain Hack Global, so uh, uh, I might give a little bit uh, answer to maybe to your question overall, not specifically the Code of Conduct, but we work with STEM on the Code of Conduct as well, so uh, so, and I have been pretty lucky to involve this year with three different events as uh, part of Brain Hack Global. So the first one was the very famous one, maybe you all had NeuroMatch Academy or NeuroMatch conferences. It happened quite early on the when the COVID started. I guess the one question, uh, the first question regarding um, so, so obviously there was no such a community before, especially in the uh, computational neuroscience society. So it's kind of uh, much, it's kind of naturally created around uh, the main, you know, one of the main um, uh, scientists, Conrad Cording from University of Pennsylvania, and then he just kind of brought, brought along his uh, own, you know, the students, and then it started growing and growing. Every week they started having some meeting but uh, because I had some uh, experiences before from the Brain Hack Global I tried to bring code of conduct because they didn't have this community structure before mm -hmm. they didn't know they were just coming together on Thursday evenings and then they were trying to have some sort of chats on the topics etc but they didn't have any uh, knowledge regarding how to run a community how to have a even didn't they didn't know having a code of conduct so and actually so even though I tried to wrote, bring all those from the brain hack experiences that we had before, so it was quite hard to implement it in the first place, and I had some resonance as well. So because they they just thought they can continue like this without having all those you know structured mechanisms or you know the um, the helpers or you know the, um, they thought everyone will come and start chatting like any others like they will feel comfortable in the second they enter the community but it was not the case and we started kind of uh, people started not joining anymore and people started feeling uncomfortable we had the first zoom bonding happening so then they wrote this blog post about it and then zoom wrote some you know the um, new adjustments about the tool and etc so I guess the, um, so the, the, the feeling what I got from this uh, very first initial COVID uh, period meetings of the NeuroMatch uh, events was if you don't start from the very early on with the structure and main aim in your mind, uh, with some, especially those kind of blues, like code of conduct, which sticks the community in a more safe and you know, uh, good environment, or a hostile environment, then you are prone to dissolve and, and you, you are prone to not have a continuity. And this kind of was the case, unfortunately. So, but when we come to the OHPM uh, events, uh, again, we have the involved as Brain Hack Global, then we, they, they um, deployed a very nice actual structure. They had helpers and uh, buddies, they called. So these people were there all throughout the event, just for to help those newcomers to find their way to 
engage with anyone. I mean, you might be using a Slack to communicate every single day. It might become kind of a part of your life, but those people don't know how to even mention someone, how to talk to someone, how yeah. to use those tools so easily. I mean, you might think of, oh, how stupid is that? They don't know how to use such an easy thing. But now it's not the case. I mean, not everyone uses those tools and open science tools, especially yeah. as a part of their life. So you always need those kind of shared parts in your life to kind of lead the way. So, and then we saw this deployed very well in OHBM, which is the biggest uh, neuroscience event in the uh, field. And then and this year in the Brain Hack Global. So um, we were successful because we had this very well established community and we were successful to keep it during our transitions from the physical to the um, um, virtual because we had this community for years almost from 2012 and we didn't lose so much blood actually along the way I mean we, we were kind of lucky to uh, bring only the difficulty we had obviously virtual events doesn't necessarily bring so much facility or ease to your life so it comes with I mean we know that community quite exhausted with having like five days long events, all of them which your main overlaps with their daily, you know, workload or, I mean, it, it, it not necessarily brings so much ease uh, in terms of your participation to the events for sure. But at least, I mean, with the brain hack, we uh, experienced this that having a very well established community who sticks well, uh, does not matter if you move on to the virtual or physical. So it, 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 it comes with this fluidity and it, it was quite nice for us to again experience. So I just tried to cover the, all of your, of your three questions <laughs> very speedily. Sorry about that. <laughs> because I didn't know if I should enter, enter in or not. Yeah. And then regarding yeah. code of conduct, I mean, yeah. as Sam said, oh, yes, it's gone. Yes, yes, please. Oh, no, I was. I, Please go on. You know, okay, I think this just, is important that you're sharing. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and the code of conduct. Yeah, we are not happy with it. First time Sam uh, joined us, actually, the first thing we uh, worked together was the code of conduct. And we proposed this new version, uh, including all the online uh, possible ways of harassment and abuse that we can think of and find out, obviously, from many other code of conducts out there. Uh, but we know that these needs to be gone through the um, lawyer processes and, and they need to be supported by some officials. I and mean, we are just two volunteers loving to do bring such support, but we are not lawyers or we are not you know, professionals in this field. So we might definitely be lacking such uh, aspects. And as Sam asked, I mean, we don't know, for example, how to cover the worldwide rules or you know, how, how we can make them generalized. So therefore, it, it, it's not easy to write something and start applying it right away. So we need to have those, um, unfortunately, review processes to be put along and then we will have a more established something hopefully from next year on because this is a very big necessity for especially, I mean, both for visual and, uh, so, sorry, physical and um, uh, ritual events. So we are working on that, but it's not an easy thing to do for sure. Sorry about that. So I just took so much time. Thank you for. Uh, you. you know, I thank you so much for sharing. Because mm -hmm. These are all challenges, and it's always good for other people about. And, you know, I think it's it is like what you said. It's very it's very hard to establish community. But of conduct. And how do you kind of go in and how do you convince people that it's necessary? So thank you very much for sharing. Um, I think we should probably move on to the last uh, scenario. Sorry, Meg, I didn't mean to monopolize the time, but we seem to want to discuss this a lot. So would you like to move, move on? Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering um, with five minutes left, if, if um, we can quickly answer this or we can sort of just synthesize what we've learned so far. Um, just given mm -hmm. the, the time. Um, but I know that we have this shared document and would love to continue to populate it um, for, for people. And I'm not sure if we mentioned at the beginning, Emily, I, um, but if we're gonna um, do some synthesis and we can report back out um, our findings. So, um, but yeah, the, the last scenario is, is, you know, you can't go and talk about any open source project uh, without funding coming up. 
Um, and, and this on, online has really changed um, some people's experiences on, um, you know, successfully fundraising when they don't have the chance to show their stuff in person and, and have those hallway chats. Um, so yeah, I'll, um, I'll open it up to the group to decide how to spend uh, the last four minutes, but um, we, we can save the, probably that, that, um, that exercise. Yeah, as Meg said, um, I was saving this for the end, but I'll jump in now since we're basically at the end. Um, we uh, do plan to write up a blog post that summarizes the key points from today's session. Um, so if you're interested in working with us on that, um, there's a space at the bottom of the collaborative doc for you to add your name and email. Um, and additionally, if you have ideas for other types of outputs that would be helpful based on our conversations today, we are all ears and you're welcome to include those ideas in the doc as well. Um, so I guess in the few remaining minutes, if anyone has anything that they would like to share about um, fundraising uh, or funding in general, um, we can certainly have a quick discussion, um, but, and then you can also leave additional comments in the notes doc after the session. I just have a question for the, to, to build on that. Um, I'm worried, you know, this has been a funny year. A lot of the work we do is with big philanthropy major philanthropies and for those organizations, you know, their budget for 2020 was already set by the time the pandemic hit. And so I'm really um, sort of, I don't have a crystal ball uh, and I'm ready to see what happens next year. And I'm a little bit worried that we could, well, there's a couple, there's so many ways it could go wrong, right? Uh, but one of them is that, um, you know, folks who might be newer to the space who already would have trouble having access to funding might have even less access because of that, those missing in-person interactions. And so much of philanthropy, I think, still operates on uh, social networks. Um, and so I'd be curious what folks on this call are thinking about that or is your experience? Um, I, I've, I've been surprised that I haven't seen our projects as impacted as I maybe worried I would um, so far, but next year could look really different. And I, I can speak to the, the local event we have in DC. Uh, we normally raise about $20,000, um, but the, we haven't, we've raised about 1100 this year. Um, and a lot of that I think is because people sign up because they want to have recruiting and they want to, you know, have something in exchange. And it's a lot harder to have that um, in, in a online online setup. So we've actually moved to, a, a, we set up a Patreon um, and are moving to more of an individual model. Remains to be seen, but I think there there's a lot of smaller groups who have a smaller operating budget that are trying to get creative. Yeah, I think there's a lot of folks working with Open Collective. Um, Open Collective mm -hmm. is uh, probably poised to um, really help people out. Um, we, we work with them, we like them. <laughs> uh, but there's like, a, a not I've never nice heard setup. of them. Isn't that oh, silly? Really? I've never heard of them. Oh, they're, they're really <laughs> great. A, yeah, well, and I it's would, yeah, a splintered they're, they're community. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're about to uh, be jetted off. So are there any last thoughts? about this people want to share i mean this has been extremely valuable for me it's always good to hear other people's experiences so thank you very much for everyone who shared thanks to everybody yeah thanks thank you everyone. everyone thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Bye. yes thank you